Chapter 5 of A Diamond Sky Above Titanic A Good Omens Fan Fiction Written by C. Blue Eyes Read aloud by Sky Asimaru If you enjoy this podfic, you can check out the original story on Archive of Our Own. If you would like to hear more of my recordings or see some of my own work, you can find me through the pen and screen name of Sky Asimaru. A Diamond Sky Above Titanic Chapter 5 Anthony Crowley's Song The violin was old and well used, with mismatched strings, and the varnish at the base worn from years of contact against acidic human skin. It was scruffy and smelt strange, and it was a far cry from the pristine Stradivarius old Antonio had made for him in 1690. But Crowley didn't mind. Neither did the fiddler to whom it belonged. He'd been more than happy to lend this strange gentleman his beloved instrument. I, for some unimaginable reason, unable to object. He was quite tired, now that he came to think of it. He really could do with a break. Nor had the other band members complained, though none of them were quite sure why. Why not let this lithe young fellow with his shiny shoes and his shiny hair and his shiny glasses play a song or two? They were sure he was very good, though why they were sure they weren't sure. Around the band, the formerly redundant dancers looked on in interest, and others gathered round in curiosity, leaning against a pillar with a drink in each hand. Aziraphale watched, and tried to summon the disapproval he supposed he was meant to be feeling. Crowley, done meeting his acquaintance with the violin, nodded cheerily to each of the musicians. A guitar, a set of alien pipes, a Bahrain drum, an accordion, a banjo-like thing, a whistle, some spoons, a spare fiddle. It looked good. He took his place in the center where the former fiddler had stood. A hush seemed to have fallen over the room, and not just because the music had stopped, but because an awful lot of people had stopped to listen now. They were waiting, waiting to see what this strange stranger would play. Crowley raised his bow, waited for further silence, and began. His melody was slow and languorous, like a record protracted for longer than it should be on its player, like a man stalking in comical slow motion. It was insidious and slinky. It teased its audience by pausing a tenth of a second too long before the next note, keeping them hanging there, waiting for more, never quite showing its full self to them. The silence between the notes was music itself. It would flicker and undulate, spiral around for a few sets of chords, then stop, short, unpredictable, before starting up again, that same swaying pattern. Then suddenly the violinist's elbow shot up in a quick flick of a note before the bow slithered across the instrument once more, and that continuous yet sinuous tune was starting again, just that little bit faster 
The music he made was rolling now, sensuous, ever so slowly creeping up on its audience, all of whom stood there, drinks halfway to their lips, cigarettes burning to their fingers. The drummer had tentatively joined in now, trusting the regular background beat enough to put a few hits in, and it reinforced Crowley's melody with structure, a note to return to, a handhold for the listeners in this unpredictable song. The bagpiper, too, then found the confidence to join in, emulating Crowley's violin. The two played together, the piper respectfully quieter, his tune a condiment to Crowley's substance. How he knew what to play, how he knew when Crowley was going to change the tempo, stop suddenly to flick up in a series of high, striking chords, he couldn't have said. The audience were swaying now. It wasn't hypnosis or possession. It was instinct. It was a dance and the dance floor was amassed with movement now. Crowley could sense the crescendo of this verse reaching its climax. It came in ebbs and flows, waves pushing up and down the beach, wetting a few extra inches of sand with each new swash. There, Crowley could sense it, sense the climax. He silenced his bow with one elegant flick of the elbow, and, grinning, enjoying every cell of his being, mentally handed the reins over to the competent piper, who was somehow prepared for this, and began an epic solo. Crowley skipped across to Aziraphale, knowing he had only seconds. Aziraphale was pink in the cheeks with his enthusiasm. Oh, my dear boy, I knew you could play, but I never knew you could compose. Crowley cackled at that. <laughs> this isn't composing, he shouted over the band and the dancers, who were now clapping in time to the beat. This is bloody good improvising. And then he took Aziraphale by the hand and dragged him towards the stage. <gasps> Crowley! Oh, Crowley, no! exclaimed the angel in self-conscious horror. Crowley, don't you dare! I need a violinist to duet with! Crowley grinned, unrelenting, as he shoved the surplus violin into the angel's hands. Come on, angel, you're better than Elgar and Liszt put together. I need you. And with that, out of time, the demon jumped back into his position, just as the piper finished his moment in the limelight. Crowley shot back in with one long sliding note and resumed, catching back in with the beat, even as it continued to increase in speed. Aziraphale stood there on the sideline, the instrument in his hand as unfamiliar yet familiar as he would imagine, for some reason, a flaming sword to feel like and felt inside his ancient being a great welling of energy, of invincibility, of euphoria. It had been so long since he'd performed, and he could remember how it felt. The joy of playing, the looks on the faces of the crowd, the awe, amazement, wonder. He stroked the violin in his hands, so familiar, and now Crowley was reaching the climax of yet another crescendo. His elbow shot up and down four times in quick succession as he lanced out four quick notes. 
and each one ran in sync with the angel's heart, pounding in its pre-performance nerves. There was a brief half-second of silence, and it was like the silence that follows the bells of New Year's. It was like blinking before the sun, and the edges remaining etched, throbbing hazily in your vision. The dancers didn't even have time to hold their breath, though they all knew in that one moment to stop moving and stare instead at the gentleman with the unforgettable violin. In that one half of a second, it seemed that the entire Titanic fell silent, that every class, every steward, every porter, every stoker pressed their ears against the general room a third class and listened with every fiber of their being. The silence lasted half a second, but it felt like a slice of eternity. Crowley's solo thus began. He was still the same, still a lithe, pale, man-shaped being, with shirt sleeves up at his elbows and braces twisted. But then he wasn't. He moved with inhuman speed, feet firmly immobile on the floor, but his upper body twisting with the tempo of his song. His elbows were everywhere as he played, his bow shooting up and down and across. So fast his hand became blurred. He played with a passion that left all who heard it breathless. Crowley looked up, flicked his hair back to see, and then beckoned with his head to Aziraphale as his hands remained busy. The violin was suddenly at Aziraphale's clavicle, and a bow, though Crowley had not given him one, was in his hand. Every self-conscious concern seemed to have vanished as he took up the space Crowley had made beside him. He joined right in with the demon, didn't slide in, but leapt in, became Crowley's worthy equal. They duetted together, the same piece, a Aziraphale's a note higher, so that their music weaved itself together. There was no time, no Titanic, no heaven or hell, no good or evil. There was only Crowley and a Aziraphale and their violins, and the music that linked their souls together wove them until they were indistinguishable from each other. Whose bow was whose? Whose note was whose? They were neither angel, nor demon, nor human. They were, and they both reached this word in their head at the same time. Both felt it sing in their chests and their hearts and their blood. Soulmates. On and on their duet went perfectly in time, a skill not inhuman, but that of a being that has lived much, much longer than any human could, and so has had an awfully long time to practice. And then, in a burst of sound and emotion, the rest of the band joined in again, like a sonic boom, or an eclipse, or a head rush, dazzling and disorientating and indescribable, and the room sang once more with the clapping of hands and the stamping of feet as the dancing resumed. Crowley and Aziraphale, standing side by side, their bows whipping back and forth, weren't even looking at their violins, or at the expressions on the faces of their audience. They were staring at each other, 
grinning wholeheartedly at their opposite, their hands a separate entity to their minds, which were reaching out to each other. Crowley was raising his brows over his glasses at Aziraphale encouragingly, as if to say, After you, angel. His smile was enrapturing, and Aziraphale laughed and obligingly took the lead, striking out a series of flickering, whistling notes as Crowley slipped to the background and played one note repeatedly in whirls, complimenting each other perfectly. It was the final crescendo now, the build-up to the long, shuddering climax that would lift the Titanic out of the water and into the sky. It was the sprint to the finish, that long last stretch where every ounce of energy can afford to be spent. And Crowley and Aziraphale were inexhaustible. Faster and faster they went, the music and the musicians, the dance and the dancers, Crowley and Aziraphale's violins constantly leading the way, higher, then lower, against each other, then together, gentle and twisting, then hard and exact. How long had he been playing? Could it really have only been five minutes? How was that possible? So close now, so close. The end was in sight. It was pressing against them. It was a swim upstream to reach it, to align the notes and tempo together. Every instrument was being strummed or hit or blown or pumped to its maximum now every human who played them giving it their all it was like delirium and it was like ecstasy aziraphale's violin called to crowley in a high inquiring chord Crowley responded, and the two beings grinned at each other, sensing it together, sensing the timing, sharing that secret between their locked gaze. Back and forth the exchange went, each note a half-second behind the other, chasing its coy lover, leaping playfully to catch up. Then, finally, finally, colliding as flawlessly and fluidly as interlocking fingers within the clasped hands of something infinitely deeper than mere friendship, the two parallels became one, and it was the two of them together who ended the great song with three short flicks of their bows the sounds like the skidding feet of an athlete who crossing the finish line tries to slow but has too much momentum and then as the rest of the band drew themselves to a close one last note from the violinists one long perfectly executed note sharp and steady as a blade sounded throughout the hall shuddering to a halt and before the duo could even raise their bows the entire third class had erupted into cheers and applause and titanic herself was joining in to be continued in Chapter 6. <laughs> Thank you for reading. Please drop by the archive and let the author know what you thought of their work.